Welcome to the Beyond the Scope podcast presented by NDMD Productions and made possible by Augusta Podcasts, your one-stop shop for launching your podcast. Let Augusta Podcasts do all the heavy lifting and give you the tools you need to turn your podcast dreams into a reality. Learn more at AugustaPodcast.com slash NDMD. I'm your host, third year medical student now, Andy. And if you are familiar with the NDMD YouTube channel, you'll know that we love sharing stories from students, residents, and attendings of different medical professions while giving you an inside look into their lives, not just as healthcare workers, but as the incredible people they are as well. This podcast continues the mission of sharing those incredible stories and experiences from students, physicians, and healthcare professionals. But this time, it's all about the things that those years of medical training doesn't really prepare you for. Things that are beyond the scope of our practice. So whether it's navigating starting a family as a medical student or physician, learning how to invest as a student, or dealing with some of the crazy unexpected situations that come across your medical training, whether emotionally, physically, or mentally, the goal is to bring on incredible role models who can guide you through those puzzling questions. That being said, let's introduce today's guest. Now, this guest is really familiar, but we're going to try something different today on the Beyond the Scope podcast, something that may turn into something bigger as we go. So uh, stay tuned and stay subscribed to uh, the NDMD YouTube channel for updates on that. But today we're going to have a surgeon come in and talk about some of their most interesting and intricate cases and how they handled some of the difficulties that they came across throughout the case. Um, today's guest, I, I don't even think needs an introduction at this point on my channel, but since I'm on internal medicine right now, I think I'm used to redundancy. So, <laughs> um, Dr. Rakowski, welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back to the channel. Um, for those who don't know you, can you introduce yourself? Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Andy. It's great to be back on the channel. Of course. Um, my name is Dr. Martin Rakowski. Uh, I'm an assistant professor of neurosurgery at the Medical College of Georgia. And I specialize in surgical neuro-oncology and skull-based surgery, so mostly in brain tumors. Awesome. And now before we dive into one of your really, really cool cases, can you tell everyone why you chose surgery to begin with? Yeah, so I think, you know, there's, there's a split that happens, I think, for every med student when you start and kind of thinking about your career and what you ultimately want to go into. And I think there are a lot of dichotomies you kind of have to decide between. You know, one is obviously surgery or medicine. Um, certainly adult patients versus pediatrics, um, you know, women's health, primary care versus subspecialty care. And I think I knew all along that I really wanted to be an expert in something. And the idea of being an expert in something that involved, you know, sort of physical motion and using my hands in a very specific skill set was always really appealing to me. So I knew it was probably going to be surgical or at least procedure based. And then I had always had this idea that, you know, brain surgery was something that I really wanted to do. Um, and part of it is that I think the anatomy is just absolutely beautiful. You know, I, I'm biased when it comes to the brain, clearly, but um, I think a big part of neurosurgery is not just deciding kind of what you're going to do once you get to an area that you need to operate in, but also how you get there. And so for me, this idea of approach selection and how we choose the right trajectory to get to an area of the brain was a really cool kind of addition to the, the normal thinking you have with other surgeries. Um, you know, more or less, if you're doing GI surgery, for example, you know, you're going to go through the belly, right? Either use a camera or not, but kind of your approach is the same no matter what. Whereas with brain surgery, depending on the area of the brain, you know, it can really vary how you approach something. So that was always fascinating to me. I love that sort of preoperative calculation you have to go through and then just seeing the anatomy and kind of the, the nature of the instrumentation we use and the steps, it's just beautiful, intricate surgery. And I just loved it. So I knew from day one, that's what I wanted to do. Man. That's incredible. And I know there's a lot of medical students and pre-med students probably in the same mindset right now. So if that sounds like you, definitely consider surgery. Um, but now you've had a couple cases that you like, end up on local news um, <laughs> for good reason. And um, I think the best podcasts and interviews that I've done is the ones that I talk the least. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to you uh, to really build this narrative of what happened. Sure. Um, so I think, you know, discussing interesting cases is always a good way to kind of highlight a specialty. And, you know, people often tend to choose kind of more difficult or complex situations. But, you know, I think it's good not to cover always the bread and butter, but sort of the, the, the cases that really kind of add some flair to the field and, and what it involves. So in my profession, I knew that I wanted to, you know, pretty much focus exclusively on brain surgery as opposed to spine surgery. And overall, it's important to know that within neurosurgery, I'd say 75% of operations 
roughly are, are going to be spine. So what I tend to do is a little bit more niche and then just focusing on brain tumors, I think is even more niche. Um, so being in academics, I have the privilege to just focus my practice primarily on cranial stuff. Um, and I took a job here specifically because of the latitude of cases that I would get to do kind of early on. So as a junior faculty attending, you know, you usually are kind of working your way up to the more complex cases and certainly having a senior partner like I had, you know, means that Sometimes there's kind of a little bit of a split, you know, the, the really, really complex stuff generally goes to the more senior partner, but I've been fortunate that I've been able to tackle some pretty complex stuff kind of early on. So um, I've been in attending now for three years and within a couple months of starting actually being in attending, so about two years ago now, um, I encountered a, a pretty interesting case, which I don't usually do. And that was actually a pediatric case. So sometimes there's a specific skill set that we have on the adult side, um, in this case doing what's called an endoscopic surgery, which is where we insert a tiny camera through the head, um, most often through the nose, but sometimes in different areas of the skull to kind of access or look around corners that we can't usually look around. Um, and so because I had that skill set and had done some fellowship training in that, one of my senior pediatrics partners actually approached me with a case that he encountered, in this case in a four-year-old. Um, I don't usually operate on children, let alone that young, um, but kids do get brain tumors, unfortunately. And even though this particular brain tumor is benign, it's something called a craniopharyngioma. Um, it was a tumor that had already recurred once. So when she was three, she had a big brain surgery where they, the prior surgeon basically went through the side of her head, lifted up part of her frontal lobes and accessed this tumor. And craniopharyngiomas are tumors that kind of arise, if you can imagine, if you go a couple inches behind the bridge of your nose, there's an area called the pituitary um, or the cella, which is a little bone that the pituitary sits in. And that's kind of our master hormonal gland in the body. And so in children, when they have a tumor that grows from that area, usually it presents as a growth disturbance. So children will stop growing the same or they're not developing the right way. And ultimately an endocrinologist will kind of work them up and discover that there was an issue. And that's what happened with her. Um, in addition to having some hormone issues, she was also losing vision. So she was having really severe headaches. And because the pituitary gland is kind of between the eyes, kind of at the back of the, uh, the brain where the, the optic nerves or the vision nerves connect to the brain, a tumor in that area will often cause visual dysfunction as, as well. So she wasn't growing correctly. She was having severe headaches. She had this massive recurrent tumor and she was starting to go blind. Um, and so my partner asked me to kind of step in because this is one of the few areas where we can actually insert a camera through the nose to access you know, that part of the brain. And it's a kind of elegant way to get there without having to go through an old surgical site. So we thought that this would be a great approach. Um, but obviously being a new faculty member, you know, there's going to be a little bit more scrutiny. You know, it's not just, you know, do you, you know, are, do you have the, the skill set and the training that you claim to, but also, you know, now it's kind of time to, to, walk the walk, not just talk the talk. So, you know, I had this skill set. I knew I could help, um, ended up being a really complex surgery that actually involved working with ENT as well. So I do all these surgeries through the nose, you know, holding a camera, um, where my ENT partner will actually kind of drive. Um, and then I'll actually do the brain tumor removal. So ended up being a really, really challenging case that thankfully went well, but, um, but yeah, that's, that's one that, you know, I, I, I didn't realize at the time when I was operating and the case took probably about six to eight hours you know, I'm focused on looking at the screen and, you know, working with my hands and obviously helping this girl. And in the meanwhile, I didn't realize over the course of the operation, I had the chief of pediatric surgery come in and kind of check and make sure things were okay. I had my own chairman, you know, the chairman of neurosurgery coming in to make sure everything's okay, you know, cause I was pretty new to a lot of people. And so for your first case to be, you know, uh, at least on the pediatric side, to be a really complex, you know, young patient um, with kind of high stakes was you know, a little, little nerve wracking even for me. So thankfully things went very well, but I had no idea at the time, kind of the, the level of scrutiny I had, but, but it felt really good to kind of finally put all those years of training, you know, to practice. Um, and so it felt, you know, like, like really redeeming, I guess is the best way to put it. So, especially when she did well. Exactly. And now you said it recurred, right? What is, what is kind of the rate of recurrence for craniopharyngiomas in children? So it's really common. And in this case, since they weren't able to remove the whole tumor before, you know, it's ultimately going to be about hundred percent, especially in a patient that young. So the trick with this type of tumor is that it can form what's called a cystic recurrence where it forms these bubbles of fluid. And so even though the tumor itself may not be growing much, they sort of form these cysts. And that's in this case, what was actually causing her vision problems and why it grew back so fast. So the trick is, you know, you, you don't want to just sort of pop the cyst. You ultimately want to remove the cyst wall. And so going in, we knew, you know, she's, four years old, she's already had a tumor occurrence once, you know, let's choose an approach where we feel like we can actually remove the whole thing. Uh, so that was the goal. And that's actually what we were able to do. So I was, I was definitely proud of that outcome. Um, and now two years later, no recurrence yet. So that, you know, that, that, that was a big win. Wow. I was, I was going to say my next question would be like, how is she doing now? 
Yeah, she's doing great. She's doing great. Um, you know, there's no way to get some of that hormone function back. So ultimately she is seeing, you know, pediatric endocrinology and getting some growth hormone and, you know, basically some uh, uh, replacement therapy to, to help her grow. But, you know, she's, we expect her to have a normal life. Um, and, you know, there are occasionally some other treatment options that we can use. But when you're talking about things like radiation, you know, in a four-year-old, we don't really like doing that. So uh, I think for obvious reasons, yeah. Of course. And I think a big question now is, You've, you've done a pediatric case. I, I think we've talked about this before, like whether you were considering specializing in pedi- pediatrics at any point in your career, would you ever feel comfortable operating on a kid again? I would. I think once you get over that, that hurdle the first time, you know, I had certainly done it many times as a resident. Um, but again, being an attending and kind of the faculty member, you know, you, you feel always obviously a much larger sense of responsibility. You know, the buck stops with you. For better or for worse, you get all the glory or, you know, the, the pain of knowing a surgery didn't go as, as you wanted it to. Thankfully, in this case, it did. Um, but, you know, that's certainly weighing on your mind is, you know, if, if you were going to come in and touch someone's life, especially when they're a child, you know, what you do can affect them potentially for the rest of their life. Um, and especially in a tumor like a craniopharyngioma that is benign. And so in many ways, the outcome depends on how well the surgery goes. You know, you kind of feel that extra pressure. It's it's. Um, you know, it's something where success really does mean a huge change in their life. Um, and so I think that was kind of a consideration. Um, you know, moving forward, I think I knew that I, I, you know, just being in brain tumors, they're just more common in adults than children. And I think with that being my main focus and, and doing skull base, which is a subset of neurosurgery, it's just not as applicable to kids. And so I think the, the skill set that I wanted to develop just made a lot more sense in adults. I have nothing against operating on children, but I often, you know, if I can, mm-hmm. I leave that to the, the pediatric subspecialist. So understand. And I, now I'm kind of curious because I, I have a lot of um, peers and mentors within the pediatric anesthesia world. And there's a lot of stories I've heard where um, very early in their attending careers, they since they work with children, um, you know, when things go wrong, things go very wrong. And, you know, in the operating room, it's it's a heavy, heavy environment. And, and they were telling me it weighed on them for many years. Um, and it took them a lot of time and a lot of um, support to get through that point. Um, and particularly because they weren't really prepared for the case. Like it was super early on. They were kind of thrust on this really poor outcome case at the last minute. What was the time frame between like when they said, hey, can we, we know you have the skill set um, to you being in the operating room, did you have any time to really like mentally and emotionally prepare to go, okay, this is my first time, breathe in, breathe out, let's do this. Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. I think, um, you know, it ended up being about two weeks or so between the time that I knew I might be involved and, and the time the surgery actually happened. You know, once once we sort of had a plan in place and decided this was the right surgery for her, we wanted to move quickly. You know, obviously losing vision and having pretty severe headaches is, is no way to to live. So we wanted to get her better as soon as possible. And once you lose vision, it's a lot harder to get it back. So, you know, if you can catch someone early enough, we can often reverse, you know, partial or rarely complete blindness, but, but at least some visual deficits. So we wanted to move fast for that. So I I think I had some time to prepare, you know, neurosurgery, I I think it works best when we consider it to be a team sport, you know, and that means the nurses in the operating room, the anesthesia team, as you mentioned, in this case, my ENT partner, I think you, you know, you want to feel that sense of responsibility and burden, but at the same time, you know, feel like a lot of people are kind of invested in, in a good outcome. And I think that just helps you emotionally, you know, as much as it does technically knowing you've got more hands there to kind of help you. But, but I think that helped me prepare for it. You know, I knew we had a really good plan. You know, I met with my partners multiple times to literally go over the steps of the case. And it really is, you know, kind of like a mental rehearsal. Um, I've done this even back then I'd done it enough times that I could kind of visualize the steps we'd be going through. Obviously the trick in this case is that kids are just smaller, right? So <laughs> we were debating, you know, is the camera that we usually use in an adult, you know, even going to fit in her nostril. Um, so, you know, little things like that, that you wouldn't normally think about in an adult, we, you know, we sort of needed contingency plans. So, you know, there's a pediatric scope that's smaller. We could use that if we had to, you know, we got a special set of scans to make sure we knew, you know, the anatomy that we were getting into. Um, with, with kids versus adults, your sinuses or the air filled spaces in the head actually get larger as we get older. So you can sometimes have like almost a complete block of bone that you have to drill through, uh, to get to the brain and children, which can make it even harder as opposed to adults where that kind of, you know, fills up with air and, and the sinuses kind of open up and, and develop. So, you know, we looked at the scans, considered all the, the things that could go wrong and, um, it's a little macabre, but I do tell my residents, you know, every time you're about to operate on someone, I want you to think about how you could potentially hurt them, you know, 
either give them a neurological deficit or paralyze them or, you know, what terrible things could happen or how can you really, you know, hurt this person and, and have them not wake up from, from surgery. The idea being that we never want that to happen. Um, you know, and, and so if you plan for the worst, you know, especially in a kid, then I think that just makes you that much more prepared. And I think emotionally it's easier to kind of settle in and say, okay, we're, we're just going to treat this like we would any other case, you know, the stakes are high, but let's follow through with our game plan. You know, I think that answered my next question would have been how, how do you prepare for cases that like, this is your first time um, doing. And I think you nailed it on the head. Like it is a team sport, you know, Mm -hmm. in given like a football analogy, you're, you guys are all in the film room working together. Like here's a game plan um, to execute. Yeah. So there's, there's a lot of mental preparation. And I mean, you know, that's, that's part of what I love so much about choosing an approach in neurosurgery is, you know, when you look at a scan, you know, you can take certain measurements and kind of anticipate what you're going to, what you're going to see anatomically with the different steps you're going through and, you know, how big an exposure is going to need to be to, to get to a place. And, you know, we just looked at her scans a bunch and realized that, you know, this, this camera based approach really would be perfect for her. So, you know, we, we had very much prepared and, you know, knew about everything that could go wrong and how to prevent that. And so I think we had a really good game plan and it's like a, a, a symphony, you know, when it goes well, it's like the conductor, you know, the surgeon in this case just gets everything in the right spot. And, you know, we, we really had a, a, a nice, actually pleasant day, believe it or not, even though it was kind of high stress. It's like when things go well, kind of according to plan, it can be a really nice, nice experience. It's just like a story that unfolds perfectly and it went really well in this case. I think it is only in surgery where you can say that a day, a six to eight hour procedure, <laughs> taking a tumor out of a four year old is a pleasant day. <laughs> well, yeah, the family was, was obviously very happy and, and we were too. So, you know, seeing them, you know, whatever your patient, you know, is going through, you know, seeing them wake up well. And, you know, in this case, she instantly noticed an improvement in her headaches and her vision got better within a day or two. So that's like a very, you know, sort of gratifying thing to, to experience and very oh. tangible, you know? I love it. That's, that's the part, those are the parts of medicine that I've been getting to see on rotations lately, just that immediate gratification and being with them throughout the process. Incredible. Yeah. And I think maybe going back to your, your prior question about why I chose surgery, you know, there is something gratifying about seeing the change in someone's health being a direct result of what you're doing physically with your hands is, you know, rewiring things, you know, fixing them, moving them, removing tumors, you know, we can break down all the movements into kind of simple things, but you know, when you actually see that change and someone wakes up and especially if there's an instant difference, which they're often, it's not that fast, but occasionally you see a patient wake up and they instantly notice a difference, you know, and that's, that's a very gratifying thing. Of course. And kind of leading off that, we'll wrap this uh, quick episode up with some advice for people who want to pursue neurosurgery. And after watching many, many of your videos on my channel, as well as some of the videos on your channel, you know, what is some advice to students out here listening to the story going like, I, I want that to be me one day. I think what I, I like to talk about a lot in choosing surgery in general, but neurosurgery in particular is this idea of entering this larger apprenticeship, um, you know, with, with kind of modern medicine, the way it's going there, I think are less and less fields where you can literally trace your skill set down to like this lineage of, of people who taught you and who taught them. That's something that's very, you know, kind of common in neurosurgery. You know, we're still not that old a profession. You know, we've been doing neurosurgery, you know, maybe about a hundred years and, you know, modern techniques. I mean, you know, just a few decades, you know, especially like with this camera based technique. So, you know, if you think about MRI just becoming a thing in medical care and, you know, like the the eighties, I mean, you know, think about how long we've actually had the ability to, you know, look at complex imaging and plan surgery. So neurosurgery as a whole is, is very young. Um, so I think that one thing that's really appealing about it is, Again, this idea of learning a skill set with your hands, you know, that not that many people know, like to me, that was always a a huge plus or a huge draw of the field. So I think you have to love the anatomy, you know, first off, it's it's one thing to enjoy working with your hands, but you have to like your medium, you know, it's like being an artist, you know, do you want to be a musician? Do you want to be a painter? Do you want to do oil, you know, acrylics? It's the same sort of thing. It's like surgery as a general isn't in general is an art, but it's sort of about choosing your medium. And, And I think the medium is determined by anatomy. So so for me, that's why neurosurgery was just such a perfect fit. Um, I think the other thing is also the potential for science in neurosurgery is pretty enormous. As we understand the brain just better how it works, you know, that's sort of leading us to come up with new ways to administer therapies. You know, for example, we actually do use lasers and little heat probes that we can basically put into areas of the brain to create lesions, you know, to help in certain instances. Um, I've talked a little bit on my channel about psychosurgery and the potential of using deep brain stimulation to treat 
you know, mood disorders and uh, psychiatric diagnoses. Uh, machine brain interface is another big one that I think we'll see, you know, probably at the tail end of our lifetime is people regularly being hooked into neuroprosthetics. So I think the potential within neurosurgery is also one thing that I loved about it is that you know that whatever field you're getting into, you know, when you graduate residency, it's going to be different in 20 years, you know. So I think the potential for technology to change the field is really huge. Um, so you're kind of banking on the future of the field in addition to all the cool things that we can do now. So if you love the anatomy, you know, if you love complex surgeries, if you love complex illnesses, it's a great field to choose. That's better advice than I've gotten from a lot of my career advisors. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Rakowski, for coming back on the show. And before we leave, if you are interested in hearing another one of his cases, go on over to Dr. Martin Rakowski, MD, YouTube channel, which uh, it's been an incredible, incredible joy it to has. watch you grow. Um, how many subscribers? I'll let you say the number. Yeah, we just hit 20,000. So, you know, I, I'm... I'm just amazed that there's any interest in, in sort of the content that I put out. Um, not surprised that everyone loves yours, but, oh, but, no. but honestly, it's, it's very humbling. You know, I, I'm, I'm very happy to be growing and, and it's been a great, you know, great thing to see the community sort of growing. So uh, definitely excited to see that continue. Absolutely. And I'm just super happy that one, having people within my own city um, really engage in the creative space and um, share that passion that I've had coming into medical school. Um, and now the podcast or at least some podcasts will be moving over to your channel to dive deeper into some of the stories from the OR. There's some running names going on, like the Surgeon's Cut, Surgeon's Notebook. We'll, we'll figure that out as we go. But if you are wanting a little bit more, head on over to that channel. And uh, of course, subscribe and like his videos. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much for watching or listening to the Beyond the Scope podcast. I hope you enjoyed today's guests and to make sure that you don't miss a single episode, make sure that you follow Beyond the Scope on all streaming platforms, as well as if you want to see the full video cut, subscribe to my YouTube channel, NDMD. As always, subscribe, like, follow, comment, all that good stuff, and we'll see you in the next one.